just tell me when you first heard Voivod. Do you remember? And yeah. I grew up outside of Washington, D.C. in Virginia, and so we, me and some friends, discovered hardcore and punk rock in the early 80s and 81 or 82. So we, we were always searching for the most fucked up, loudest, most dissonant, most fringe, uh, extreme bands we could find. And we'd go through the record stores, and where we lived, it was hard to find a lot of really underground stuff. You'd go into Washington, D.C., and uh, hit all the record stores there and try to find, you know, the, the really crazy shit. And uh, I don't remember what year it was. I think it might have been 1984 or 85 that uh, a good friend of ours went up to New York City to see, um, to see Venom play. And we all loved Venom. It was a show. It was Venom and the Cro-Mags and, uh, and Voivod. And I remember he came back from that trip. He was there for a few days. <clears throat> we went into his bedroom where we used to smoke pot and hang out all day long. And his walls were painted black. And, and uh, we were totally into, like, Charlie Manson and Jim Jones and shit like that. And so the posters all like crap all over the place. And I remember walking into his room and the song Thrashing Rage from Roar was on. And I... I immediately looked at him and said, who the fuck is this? This is insane. What is this? And he goes, dude, this is, this is the best band I've ever seen in my life. I said, who is it? He said, it's this band Voivod from Canada. I just saw them open up for Venom at the Ritz in New York. And so we got high. And then he explained the show. He said it was nuts. He said the singer came out in gas mask. And he had the smoke machine. He's blowing smoke from side to side. And I guess they opened with Thrashing Rage. And so I was sitting there trying to imagine, looking at the pictures on the back of Roar, just trying to imagine this band to be for real because I'd never heard anything like it before. It was probably the most chaotic album I'd ever listened to. And I'd listened to some pretty fucked up shit at that point. But Voivod, to me, it, w it really was that, that picture on the cover of Roar that's like some fucking futuristic, apocalyptic tank or whatever it was. To me, that was the sound of the band. I mean, they just sounded like a steamroller and, and uh, you know, Snake's accent. And the lyrics were so great, man. You know, the butcher is running down the lamb, you know, shit like that. Like... Man, I get chills when I think about it because when I, when I first heard it, I just thought, this is the most badass band I've ever heard in my life. And there wasn't anything like it. And from that day on, the heaviness of any band that we listened to was sort of gauged by how they live up to Voivod. And nobody ever did. I mean... After when Killing Technology came out, it they they took kind of a left turn, you know, and and we always followed them wherever they went, whichever direction they they moved in, we would follow them. But but they to us they were they were the perfect mix of of the uh, the dissonance and aggression of a lot of the punk rock that we were that we were listening to. But uh, but there was something more than that. They were, you know, it seemed like they were from another world, or they had created their own world. And and uh, with their albums, you were invited for a little while. But but it was somewhere else. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't where I was from. Yeah, they were amazing. You know, it seemed like Voivod strayed from any conventional arrangement or composition or melody, you know, yeah. uh, or scale. I mean. I don't know. I can't read music. I just play chords and write songs. And um, maybe Piggy was doing some fucked up jazz shit. I don't know. But uh, but to me, one of my other favorite guitar players, Greg Ginn from Black Flag, he uh, he said that you know the, the challenge is to find all the wrong notes. And um, and when you first heard Voivod, you'd think like, oh, God, somebody fucking. Just get that guy up half a step, you know? He's, he's kind of off just by that much. And after a song or two, you're like, oh, damn, that's intentional. I get it. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a pretty ballsy thing to do.
to to really twist someone's ear until it hurts, you know. And uh, and I think with Piggy, you know, he definitely had his style and he definitely had his his chord structure and, and his his sense of riff, you know. But um, but he could take a left turn on you like that, and you you know, just when you think you got a hold on what he's doing. It's like holding a fish or something. It just kind of jumps out of your hands, and it, and uh, he takes you to a new place. It's almost like he he wouldn't be satisfied with you like, resting comfortably in in a in the repetition of a riff. You know, he was too much like this. He's moving on to the next, and the time signature would change, and there's a new riff, and it's even more fucked up than the last one. And it, you know, it was the guy just never let grass grow under his feet. He was always moving on to the next thing, and he just moved quick. You know. It's, the same, it's funny, it's the same record for me. It was Roar. Roar. Absolutely. Well, then I went back and listened to War and Pain. I'm like, God, this is even more fucked up. <laughs> oh, my God. Damn. Pretty amazing. I always remember the intro to the new record. Have you heard it? I've only heard the first song. Oh, okay. We just got them at the studio about uh, the day before we came out, uh -huh. and we were working, mixing this live thing of our own, and so I popped it in. And, um, and what I understand is they made the record from a lot of the demos that he'd been working on. Yeah. I remember the first time I went to see him play, I think it was on the Killing Technologies tour, and uh, and um, and I got to the gig, and it, you know, there were kids there with Creator shirts, and there were kids there with Motorhead shirts, and and Megadeth shirts, and but then there were punks, you know, and then there were just musos, dudes that you know, sat in their basement for 12 hours a day, and played that fucking Ingbe shit or whatever. <laughs> I mean it was really a it was a diverse audience. It wasn't wasn't just a metal audience. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of my friends who were straight up thrash metal fans had a hard time with Voivod because they were just too different for them, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a lot of respect for them for that, that they were mostly interested, I think, in fucking with people's heads or opening people up and mm. not conforming to any one kind of uh, genre or subgenre or whatever. Um, they just did their own thing, you know? If you want to come join the party, come on, you know? If not, that's cool. Yeah. Do what we do. Yeah. Well, you know, with, with musicians, I think that, um, you know, the idea that, uh, that playing music is, is supposed to be individually expressive and each person plays an instrument differently than the next. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that and my favorite musicians are the ones where you can hear a snippet of what they're doing whether it's a drum track without any music or just a guitar riff for 10 seconds you immediately know who it is. That's, that's, that's the goal I think is that um, you know, every musician wants to have their signature you know and, and Voivod had four of them you know uh, from Blackie's bass playing to, to Michelle's drumming. I mean, you just knew when Michelle was playing the drums. And with Piggy and Snake, it's the same thing. It's, you, can't, you could hand Piggy's guitar to someone else and it would sound completely different. Um, the drums are an acoustic instrument. You play them with your hands, really. And, uh, and it, it's not so much coming from the instrument as it is coming from here and coming from your heart. Mm. And... Um, then the fact that Voivod sounded like no one else, I think, uh, was testament to how they were, they, they didn't seem to follow anyone at all. They just kind of, they seemed like they were leading something, but no one could follow that, you know? They, I don't, I've never heard a band that sounds like Voivod still to this day, ever. Yeah. Not even close. I remember hearing a Rush record once where Lifeson hit a couple of those chords, but that, that's not yours. You know. <laughs> yeah, there's Voivod stickers all over my house. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. Tell me about the Probot record and, and, the, and the Voivod element in, in the record. Well, the Probot record um, was kind of a fluke. I, had, I used to have a studio in my basement in Virginia and Foo Fighters had just made an album that was kind of mellow. We'd made this really melodic, mid-dynamic album, and, uh, and which is what we wanted to do. And we went out and we were doing tours for that. And, you know, I grew up listening to fucking metal. And so I had just made this really mellow record, and we were doing these gigs, 
and to warm up for these gigs, I would listen to some old uh, Motorhead or listen to some Sepultura or listen to some Voivod just to get pumped up for a gig. And then I'd go out and play these really nice songs. And after a couple months of doing that, I thought, God, this is weird, man. What am I doing? I mean, I love riffs and I love the aggression of really powerful music, you know. And uh, so I went and just recorded all these instrumentals for fun. And a friend of mine said, man, are you going to sing on this? And I said, no, I don't think so. He said, is this Foo Fighters music? I said, no, not really. And we had some beers, and we came up with this idea that, oh, God, imagine the wish list of getting all your favorite singers from this uh, specific, um, from this scene, you know, from this time. Mm -hmm. uh, and at that point, there were maybe five or six songs that I'd recorded, and... So I really I made a list of all of my favorite singers. There wasn't anyone that I kind of liked. It was like every one of these singers, I had every one of their records, and I'm still a huge fan. And I started making calls, and um, and Snake was was one of the first people that that we considered, and um, and we didn't. I didn't have the track at that point. Once we came up with the concept, I went in and recorded more stuff. And I, I had the list of all the vocalists, and so I started recording more music, and then it sort of, I started to discover which songs would be good for which people, because with these ten people in mind, you kind of revisit all of those old, you know, just that vibe, or just the, that sound, or the feel of that time, and uh, recorded all these songs, and there was just one song, and I'm like, man, that is definitely... Gonna, I'm not gonna. At one point, I thought, oh, I'll mix it up. I'll give King Diamond the thing that should go to Snake, and I'll give, uh, you know, Kronos the thing that should go to Eric from Trouble or whatever. It's just doing that. And I thought, no, that's stupid. I gotta, I gotta, I'm gonna, I'll come to their party, you know. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll bring my own beer. And so I, I had this song, and his was the first one that came back. And man, it was, we were so blown away. We were so blown away, A, that the project actually worked, that we talked, we said, hey, do you want to do it? We sent the tape, maybe a month later it came back, I put it in my car, and it was like Make-A-Wish Foundation, you know? It was unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, really, growing up, listening to one of my favorite bands ever, and then to have Snake put his stamp on one of my songs, was just like, ah. Oh. Awesome. It was unbelievable. Yeah. And from that moment on, I knew, like, ooh, this is going to work. This is going to be a record. Yeah. It'll be great. Awesome. Well, for someone who created this world of madness and this musical, just insane, he seemed like the happiest guy I'd ever met. Every time I met him, he was laughing. He was always happy, you know? He seemed like a really happy guy, like a really nice guy, you know? And, uh, yeah, I get nervous around heroes, you know, when I when I meet someone that that I've grown up, someone that's helped me grow up, you know, uh, I kind of choke up a little bit and get a little shy and quit. I prefer to not talk. I'll just listen to you for a while. How about that? <laughs> and uh, I, I just remember him being so so nice and very cool. Just you know fellow musician mm -hmm. who just loved doing what he do. Mm -hmm. I heard I heard from a friend that he was ill and uh, it seemed like it happened kind of quickly that uh, when he found out he was sick to the time that he passed away and um, we have a lot of mutual friends in, in Montreal and and uh, just old friends that I've known since the Fufoon punk rock days and and uh, and I heard that he passed, and you know, it's it's weird. It's, you'll always remember where you were and what you were doing, and when something like that happens, and uh, you know, you take out a Voivod record and you listen to it, and and the next time you see a friend that you share the love of Voivod with, you talk about him, and you just go, God, can you believe that? Hmm. What a drag, man. And then you relive all of your wonderful Voivod memories. And remember that time at Fufoon where Michelle wanted to buy my 28-inch ride cymbal? And, <laughs> and, you know, you just kind of reminisce. Yeah. yeah.
Well, you know, the crazy thing about Snake, you know, the early records, um, War and Pain and, uh, and Roar, you know, he really, he grew into melody, you mm -hmm. know? And the challenge of, of writing a melody over some of those, those instrumentals must have been almost impossible, you know? Um, that's fucking Rubik's Cube shit. That's like, you can't just go do some funky blues 12 bar shit over that. You know, you really, you have to find your place between the bass and guitars and on top of the drums. And it's, you know, and it's not easy. That's a difficult thing to do. So, um, a lot of imagination. Involved. Absolutely. Yeah. And he did it oh, album after album after album. And, you know, by the time, by Dimension Hattress, the, by the Nothing Face, like he got, it was, I mean, they were becoming like these beautiful songs, beautiful in their like deconstructive, dissonant, weird, instrumental, fucking time signature, spiderweb mess. You'd have Snake on top with this song, singing uh, great lyrics, and you know his voice. You listen to you listen to Roar, and you're like, that fucking crazy. He's a singer. <laughs> that guy sounds like he's getting into a bar fight, you know? <laughs> and then a couple albums later, it's like, oh my God, wow. Even, you know, by the third record, it really started happening. Yeah. But anyway, um, <laughs> but also, one of my favorite things about a lot of, uh, some of my favorite singers um, sing with an accent. And I always loved Snake's accent so much, man. Like, that, uh, that French-Canadian accent with those lyrics I mean I could I never I couldn't tell what he was singing until I saw a lyric sheet and then when I would sing those songs I would try to sing them like him you know when I sang them at shows I didn't sing them like myself I did them with the accent yeah. you know because it made it even more sinister it kind of just made him seem even a, just a little more off or something yeah, yeah. and uh you know, I loved the way he double tracked his voice. I just loved his voice. He had a great yeah. voice. Well, I think that I think that Voivod's legacy probably is that they were associated uh, with this underground scene, metal bands and punk bands, um, and for a scene that was supposed to be on the on the fringe of everything else they were even outside of that and to see their progression from the first album to the new album to see the direction that they took uh, they never stayed in one place too long musically they grew from from sounding like a n nuclear war to to writing masterpieces you know that um, that were musically that just far above what any other band in their genre was doing, and um, you know it's like there's King Crimson fans that listen to Voivod and think, okay, now that's what I'm talking about. Like that's those guys are really doing it. Um, I think that. That just when you say Voivod, for people that that know about the band, when you when you say Voivod, you just you you think of that world that they created, and uh, and there's nothing else like it, you know. I think they're just they're they're one of a kind. There's not too many bands you can say that about. Really, there's no one like Voivod. I don't think, I've never heard another man like him.